Welcome everybody to our diversity collaborative meeting. And I think that all meetings should start with great music that's self-selected by Mike Pierre. Uh, it's just my opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for, for kicking us and getting us started today. Um, Mike, would you mind sharing the screen for us? Um, Thank you for signing in as well and just like letting us know where you are and how you are feeling today. Um, we've got friends coming in from New York, from Bogota, Colombia, from Princeton. I think there are friends from Japan right now, Luxembourg, Virginia, New Jersey, China, Nanjing. Hello from Dubai, Hanoi. Hi everybody and I'm currently signing in at the moment from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Good morning, good evening, and welcome. So Mike, we're gonna move on to the next part. Next slide, please. So as we check in today, just really briefly, I'd like you to start thinking about what is one highlight experience or lesson you have gained this school year that has been impactful for you and the communities you lead and serve. So just really like a one-liner there. And we would love to celebrate um, especially because this is the last meeting that we have for the school year. So just really thinking about that highlight experience and lesson. Um, put it in the chat or feel free to unmute your microphone and just share it out loud to everybody. Welcome to just to those who just signed on today. We have a really quick check-in that is on the screen at the moment before we get started. Focus and outcomes that intention, the power of the power of empowering students. Thanks, DJ. Thanks, Liz. Crystal, thank you for sharing. Always meeting people where they are. Love in your heart. Love will find you when the going gets tough. Thank you, Heather. I'm gonna let you um. Yes, ALA conference in January 2024, getting to hug Joel. Thank you. Yes, that was also a highlight for me, Angeline. Thank you, everybody. So feel free to continue adding some of those highlight experiences and lessons that you have because we'd love to celebrate them because it is important for us to be able to learn from each other's um, celebrations and strengths um, that, that will support us in our conversation and in our action in our international school community. So for some of you who are also listening to this recording, thank you and we hope you're doing well um, wherever you are. Mike, next slide. All right, I'm gonna pass this on to Molly Faye, if Molly Faye is here. Joel, I don't think she's here. So you, you want to do this? Yeah, we'll just do that. We'll, we'll do this one. So just really, um, we always share this one at the very beginning of our meetings, this really quick norm around practicing and promoting psychological safety, um, speaking out and calling in, every voice is valued, listening with intention to learn and unlearn, practicing inquiry, um, examining our privileges and staying brave. And so I'd like you to think about for just a couple of um few, few seconds, what norms will support you in your learning today? All right, and I'd like you to hold on to that thought um, as you are engaging today in our learning um, for your for our meeting today. All right, Mike, on, on to the next slide. Um, yes, our meeting agenda today, just a really quick welcome and check in. And then we're gonna pass you on to our vision, our commitment, a reminder of that, a reminder of the background of Diversity Collaborative, our purpose and the actions that we have been um, continuously developing. And then we're going to have our Ignite speaker today, Dr. Yolanda Cilio Ruiz, which will, who I'll be introducing in a few. And then there will be breakout sessions as well um, in relation to um, our learning from, from Dr. Cilio Ruiz. Mike? Liz, on to you. Excellent. So I am stepping in for Maddie. Um, so just wanted to remind everybody what the mission and vision of the Diversity Collaborative is. And the mission is really focused around how we 
make sure there's more diverse, diverse, inclusive, equitable, and just um, leadership at international schools. Um, and we know there's lots of efforts being made, but we decided to focus in this instant on leadership. And um, the notion was that if we had more diverse leadership and we distributed leadership more broadly, it would lead to more equitable schools. So you can find more about it on the website, which is right there for you. Next, Joel. Thanks, Liz. Mike, on to the next slide. Our commitment, Jennifer is here. Jennifer, on to you. Yeah, hi. Um, our commitments have always been about diversity and equity in every form to for inclusion and justice. And concurrently, we are acknowledging that schools can demonstrate leadership uh, by serving as a change agent. And we are very hopeful that the conversations that we have within the Diversity Collaborative can lead to that. Uh, we are also very uh, cognizant of developing a mindset for equity. And we really know that that is really important in order for leadership to thrive, in order for leadership to be acknowledged and for to bring in those people of color into the leadership roles of, of international schools. Thanks, Jennifer. Next slide, please, Mike. Next slide, Mike. All right, so at this point also, we just would like to highlight um, the, the first consultants and facilitators that we have for Diversity Collaborative. And so it is on the ISS website of the Diversity Collaborative. So check out our consultants, professional biography and services, um, contact details in there as well, so you can reach out directly to them, All right? Next one, Mike. Um, Liz, would you like to step in for? Um... Sure. Um, so this one of the um, groups that we've had working from the beginning is on data and research, and um, we've done a series of studies over the course of the last five years. Um, there are three studies that were focused on this year. One was a um, a re resurveying about career pathways, and that's really um, George Mason University has been taking the lead on that and they are 95% done their study. So that will come out soon. Um, there's also been a group that's working on how to get BIPOC voices out into the community more strongly um, and a real focus on both sort of sharing challenges, but also really sharing um, possibilities and opportunities and successes as well. Um, and then um, the final project that the group has been working on is doing a bank of survey questions that schools could draw from to create their own surveys, but there, there would be some commonality in some of the questions, so. Thanks, Liz. Yep. Yeah, and then this part as well, please stay in touch with our community and communications. You know, we've got, we're on Facebook, we're in um, LinkedIn, as well as Diversity Collaborative and Twitter. Um, but also, if you do have any announcements for our community, Mike Pierre, our editor for our newsletter, has been um, curating and, and really inviting diverse voices from our community, specifically with, with, with a lot of alignment to our purpose. And so it usually gets released in September, January, and March. Um, and so Mike, Mike's email is right there. Send an email to Mike to say, here, here are some announcements around what it is with a strong focus on equitable um, leadership, equity and leadership. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and yes. I want to just um, do a shout out to all the presenters who have um, presented this year. So we begin the year with Kevin um, Simpson um, and did a great job of sharing the journey that ALOC has had. Um, we then heard from the leadership at um, ASA and their um, remarkable progress that they've made um, both within their institution, but also across the region and sort of sharing the resources that they've created with all of us. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from um, Yolanda this morning. Uh, she's a wonderful, um, warm, wise person that uh, Joel will tell you more about. I also want to do a thank you to the facilitators of the Diversity Collaborative. So Joel and Jennifer and Maddie have been um, leading this group for many years at this point. So really um, immense gratitude to all of you. Um, and then Mike and Molly Faye um, and Dana have been behind the scenes. So thank you to them too. 
Thanks, Liz. And a thank you to you, Liz, and to ISS for always being there for us for, you know, when other organizations are pushing back from equity issues and diversity, you have been, ISS has still been in that forefront of leadership in this area, and we want to thank you for your leadership in this, and of course, to Joel for everything that he's doing. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, at this point, we've got our um, dates to be confirmed still for our next meeting, for next year's meeting, um, October 2024, February 25, and May 2025. And so please be on the lookout for confirmed dates, and we will be communicating that as well very soon. So at this point, I am going to introduce to you our Ignite speaker for today's meeting. It is really an honor to introduce our guest speaker today, a friend and a mentor, Dr. Yolanda Celia Ruiz. Dr. Celia Ruiz is an award-winning professor of English education at Teachers College, Columbia University. She's a pioneer in research and racial literacy and teacher education, as well as black girl literacies and black and Latinx male high school students. Dr. Um, Celia Ruiz is highly sought after for her expertise in race, cultural responsive pedagogy and diversity. She collaborates with K-12 and higher education communities to help them enhance their understanding of um, racial literacy, to foster more equitable school experiences, particularly for Black and Latinx students. You might also recognize her from Spike Lee's documentary, Two Fists Up, We're Gonna Be All Right, which delves into the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as her notable work, The Archaeology of the Self. So Dr. Yolanda Celia Ruiz also co-authored a book with, with Dr. Detra Price Dennis titled, Advancing Racial Literacies in Teacher Education Toward Activism for Equity in Digital Spaces, which was published in April 2021. She has also been interviewed for NYU Steinhardt on Culturally Responsive Teaching, which is really one of my favorites of her work, of many work that she has done, um, entitled Self-Work Before a Toolkit. And also check out her recent article in the May 2024 News Link, which was released last week, published by International School Services. In addition to her academic work, Dr. Yolanda Silly Ruiz is a talented poet. Her debut poetry collection, Love from the Vortex, which I have a wonderful signed copy, um, and other poems that she has, was released in March 2020, followed by her sophomore collection, The Peace Chronicles, in July 2021. Dr. Celia Ruiz's work is truly transformative, and I'm grateful for her friendship and mentorship, and she's now a part of our community as well um, as our Ignite speaker today. Um, she's someone whose insights and passion continue to inspire me and many others who are doing this work alongside everybody. It is an honor and a joy to have you lead our learning today, dear friend. Welcome to the Diversity Collaborative and to the international education community. The, you have your leaders and educators who are committed to our shared work of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so on to you. Wow. Wow. Good morning. Good evening. But first, Joel, thank you so, so much for having me here. Thank you, Liz, for saying yes to Joel's request. And I am honored. You have to know that. And I have connections with teaching abroad, the more we get to know each other, I'll share about that. But but let me just say that I continue to learn and I continue to be inspired by what leaders are challenged to do and pushed to do, as Jennifer said, in spite of the current climate, right? In spite of many folks in the US and other spaces pulling back, but for ISS to say, no, we will double down and do our best to support leaders as we support children and their families throughout the world. Um, I am I'm aware of the time, but I do wanna show you some slides. And I will tell you that I'm a visual learner. And so in that, um, what I'm sharing with you this morning, um, I hope um, will activate um, your own thoughts um, as I share these images and some of my thoughts with you. So the archaeology of self-engaging mindsets and models for racial literacy and reflection. So today's path and the short time that we have, including uh, at least a 15-minute breakout for you to speak with each other, I wanted to think about unlearning racism and bias from childhood. 
I want us to think about understanding the role of self and unearthing equity in leadership. And I absolutely must say that I am aware of the incredible work that Joel and team members have been doing for years with ISS. So I'm not coming in to this um, talking to folks that don't have the experience of putting themselves on the line, don't have the experience of challenging themselves. Um, and so I just want to be aware that I'm coming into the conversation, hopefully to lift the conversation um, and maybe give you a few things to think about for yourself. Uh, what I'd love for you today is to think about what are you releasing? Um, before I go into any community, uh, my classroom community, professional unlearning, I like to call it professional unlearning um, instead of professional development because there's so much for us to unlearn uh, before we can develop new skills. Um, and there's a lot happening in the world. There may be a lot happening in your own personal lives. I'm sure it is. But what are you willing to release today, at least for the remainder of this meeting? Just take a moment. And if you feel um, compelled, please put it in the chat so that your colleagues um, can be thinking of you, be in community with you as you let something go. I'm going to release my to-do list and it is long. <laughs> what are you releasing today? And Joel, if anything pops up in the chat, please lift up um, the voices in the community. I'll just give another few seconds for us to think about this. Folks have written my overfull inbox, my disillusionment, mm -hmm. perfectionism. Ooh, let that I go. Am, I am releasing other people's responsibilities, even if they think they're mine. Disappointment in adult behavior. Perfectionism is also um, shared again. Yes. No, thank you for that. And keep it coming in. Uh, there is a lot to release and it's continual, right? We have to remind ourselves, particularly of the, this idea of perfectionism, um, really understanding where that comes from. Uh, where did it begin? How is it perpetuated in our schooling and our workplaces? And uh, who does it serve? to have this type of mindset that everything has to be perfect. And is there such a thing with such uh, human, I would say, fragility and complexity, uh, what is perfect and what is perfect for one community certainly is not perfect for another. So I encourage you to continue to release, um, to release it. But I do want to talk about you, even though this says me. I want you to see this slide as an opportunity for you to really think about yourself. And that is the idea of the archaeology of self, not in the sense of navel gazing and being self-centered. I mean, there, there has to be some centering of the self in order to interrogate the self, in order to excavate uh, those ideas, those uh, stereotypes that we hold that interfere with us seeing populations as fully human. And while we would never say that, oh, I think that that group is less than, we would never probably say that, but our actions, our policies, what we've been told to believe over time, actually beginning from childhood, uh, really sanctions uh, those types of beliefs and they play out in the things, the inequitable practices that exist and in um, sometimes being stopped by the fear to make change of those inequitable practices. So some working agreements for you and, and this is really quickly, because um, I'm, I'm just aware of the time, but for the time that we have together, be honest with yourself and the questions that are being asked. Have some grace with yourself. That is needed if we're going to be honest, because we're confronting things that we've been holding on to and uh, ideas that were taught by people that we love dearly, parents, teachers, family members and challenge yourself. And these working agreements, I'm hoping, um, are ones that are familiar to you, that you've taken on as leaders uh, as you continue to do the work that you do in your school environment. 
And you probably can't see it because it's really um, an expanded image of this, but this is a wheel of fear and hope. And uh, I'm not a gambler, although I do like the slot machines every now and then when I go to Atlantic City. I know someone's here from New Jersey, but this is more like the Russian roulette uh, wheel, right? And instead of numbers, there are only two choices. It's fear or it's hope. And at any time, I think we are, are probably all times, we're battling between the two, but particularly when it comes to facing racism and white supremacy thinking and the way that it permeates our lives. Um, we are hopeful that if we come together and if we change policies, well, first of all, change our beliefs, which impact our practices, our practices impact our policies, that we feel hopeful for change. And we know historically, each in whatever country you are in, you know that there has been uh, a history of inequality for some groups over others. And so we remain hopeful. And I think a sign of, of hopefulness is being in education. That's why I left corporate America. I wanted to come into a space where I felt that I could put my body and my mind on the line that would make a difference for someone else. But most of the times we are overrun with fear. And the fear is real because there are policies that are made above us. There are resources that are taken away if we lean too much into our hope. The fear just sort of comes to quiet us down or sometimes to silence us. My question to you is what are you most motivated by in doing this work? What do you choose more, fear or hope? And we need hope to overcome fear because of the world that we are living, the world that's been uh, designed before any of us were here. And I call on many muses in doing this work. I call on uh, James Baldwin, whom I affectionately call Uncle Jimmy, Maya Angelou, no surprise, uh, as being a poet and an incredible thinker, uh, and also Toni Morrison, who uh, was prolific in her writing about race and the understanding of race, and particularly how it impacted Black people in this society. And she said, I have never lived, nor have you, in a world in which race did not matter. And while we hope, that this will not be the future of the children who are being taught in our schools. We have to be, in this case, um, oh, we cannot be overcome by fear to not talk about this if we want their future to be different, if we want our own future to be different. In spite of all that is happening, I remain hopeful. I remain hopeful for places like ISS, for people who have figured out how to navigate the onslaught of um, criticism against what we call diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, because the work is still done, it needs to be done. As long as we are human and existing together in a racially stratified society, we will always need to do this work. And so Morrison is a reminder of why hope has to override fear, because it is the existence of our world. And for me, what I'm trying to do, how I'm trying to be hopeful, is to add to the conversation through racial literacy for an improved civil society worldwide and also particularly for independent schools. And this is the model. I won't spend too much time on it because each of these components or their own three to four hour um, professional unlearning experiences. And what I'm so grateful for is that they organically developed during uh, COVID-19. As schools uh, and businesses were pivoting online, they still need to have professional development. And so this work that I've been writing about and thinking about since 2011, learning from sociologists, learning from filmmakers, learning from um, um, urban education scholars, it forced me to look at my own practice and to look at the ways that I engage uh, teacher educators and business leaders. I spent 13 years in corporate, so I do a lot of work with businesses and taking on this conversation of race and seeing that the needed conversations needed to be seen as literacy, particularly in schools, as there's math literacy, social studies literacy, we need racial literacies to understand all that we 
or being invited to think about. And so critical love is the basis. For me, love is the answer, no matter the question. But having a profound and ethical commitment for the students who are in the independent school network is very different than just loving them. There's a type of or a level of responsibility that we must have as leaders and as teachers to make sure that everyone has an opportunity at an equitable practice, that are they are seen as fully human and deserving of what has been reserved for only a few for so long. Critical humility, we need this type of humility because as we go deeper into learning, by the way, about historical literacy, it may personally and deeply challenge what we understand to be true. So arrogance really has no place to say, oh, I know that, or just dismissing it as propaganda or dismissing it as a political uh, agenda. Yes, education is political. However, when we are looking at the deep humanity of our students and of our teachers in the face of history that we have not been taught, there has to be a stance of humility in order to learn this new knowledge that you're taking in, this knowledge that you didn't know, even if you've been in the field. I'm going into my 30th year and I am learning something new all the time. Critical reflection is an imperative for leaders in particular. You make decisions sometimes quickly and uh, it may not always be the result that you hope for, but you must take that time to reflect so that in your praxis, right, you can be reflexive, meaning you can look at what you've decided and your practice should always be to reflect on it, but then to make needed change. That's the reflexivity. So critical reflection, historical literacy, I mentioned there are multiple histories that we have not learned. At least I can talk about the U.S. We are given stock stories and history that keeps groups of people as dehumanized and others as saviors. And this, all of this work, what I am inviting people to do as they think about it, lands with the self. And this archaeology of self is a deep excavation of your beliefs, of your biases, the stereotypes that have been put into you from the time that you were a child. And then, of course, my hope is that we interrupt. We interrupt on a personal level and we interrupt on a systemic level. And these are some things that Joel mentioned, uh, writings that I do. Uh, the poetry books actually are art artifacts of my archeological dig around love and intimacy. The advancing racial literacy is an artifact, if you will, on my research on racial literacy and how we develop it in teachers and students. And then the book in the corner, these are other papers I've written, but the book in the corner I'm most inspired by because there were two literacy scholars and a teacher who took up the model that I just showed you and wrote an entire book about it. They actually wrote the book I should have written but I am also still learning. So racial literacy, I say, particularly in teacher education and in teacher leadership, it calls for self-reflection, for moral, political, and cultural decisions about how teachers and about how leaders can be catalysts for societal change. For me, education, coming out of darkness, going into light, is all about change. It is about liberation. This is, I'm hoping, why we do what we do. And for those who are not free, it is our job to free them. Like that should be in the job description, liberation. But first we have to learn about the systems of injustice and explicitly teach our students. Yes, even if they're kindergartners, there's a way that our teachers can teach about liberation because inequality and oppression is present. And wherever that is present, liberation must also be present. And since I'm an English uh, teacher uh, in training, I use a uh, critical text, journaling, we use embodiment practices, dialogue, anything that is going to help lift the critical consciousness of my students and those who will become teachers. And this is around the topics of racism, discrimination, prejudice. And of course, lastly, um, I'm asking for teachers and leaders to act against injustice in their school, in their school settings when they recognize it. The point I'm making is while racial literacy is very much a theory, 
it is most importantly a practice. And the archeology span of self, which is, as I mentioned, the tool to do the unearthing of critical love, critical humility, historical literacy, critical reflection, so that we can move towards interruption is a pivotal component of this six step development model. And no, you don't go one, um, it's not uh, linear in that sense, because one could be developing their critical reflection while they're learning historical literacy. And I already mentioned, we have to have critical humility while we're learning more about history. But what's important for me about rich literacy is inviting a personal and collective healing. So I see racism, as Toni Morrison mentioned, she said it's a neurosis. It's an illness that no one really examines for what it is. And so if racism is an illness, then we need to be well. We need healing. And so for me, this idea of excavating, of, of ridding the self of these biases, these stereotypes, is to remove the illness. And so for me, healing has to be part of it. The self-examination and engaging such self-excavation by which individuals lean into, they confront their beliefs and their biases, much as what you've been doing over the years with Joel. It is crucial. It is, it's not just an exercise in DEIB. It's crucial for creating and maintaining a more inclusive, a just and healthy school environment and civil society. This is how I see archeology span itself. And there's so much for us to unlearn um, from even before we were born. And I don't know if you can see this slide. I hope um, I see a bunch of boxes on my screen. I hope it's not blocking anything. But of course, I can make this available to you. And of course, it's online. Uh, when people say, are your kids too young to talk about race? The answer is no. Because silence around race reinforces the racism in and of itself. And so this chart, I'm going to actually play a clip. So I'm asking you to use your, um, your listening skills and your reading skills at the same time. I hope it's not an overload for anyone. If it is, just do what is best for you. Um, but it's important to see that by two years old, children are using race as a reason for how they behave. As young as two years old. By five years old, children in kindergarten show many of the same racial attitudes as held by their teachers and their parents and other adults in their lives. This is why it's so difficult to break this. If we think about what the psychologists are telling us, right? The child development scholars are telling us, the racial scholars are telling us, but here's the good news. Here's the good news. Between five and seven, in as little as a single week, if we have constructive conversations about race, interracially, that can change a child's mindset. So I can only, and I believe in theory, I can only believe that somewhere we're not doing the work. Mm -hmm. and as adults, we're not breaking down our own practices around racism. Implicit bias, that term has been used a lot lately after several high profile shootings of black men by police. And it's also become a divisive topic in this presidential election. The term refers to how attitudes or stereotypes can affect what we say and do without a person being conscious of it. To find out more about where this concept comes from, we turn to Mazarine Banaji. She and another psychologist, Anthony Greenwald, wrote a book called Blind Spot, outlining a theory they came up with 20 years ago known as implicit bias. And she told us about the moment she realized our decisions are guided by forces we're not even aware of. So just to go back a little bit to the beginning, in the late 1990s, I did a very simple experiment with Tony Greenwald in which I was to quickly associate dark-skinned faces, faces of Black Americans, with negative words. I had to use a computer key whenever I saw a black face or a negative word like devil or bomb, war, things like that. And likewise, there was another key on the keyboard that I had to strike whenever I saw a white face or a good word, a word like love, peace, joy. I was able to do this very easily. 
But when the test then switched the pairing and I had to use the same computer key to identify a black face with good things and white faces and bad things, my fingers appeared to be frozen on the keyboard. I, I literally could not find the right, the right key. That experience is a humbling one. It is even a humiliating one because you come face to face with the fact that you are not the person you thought you were. Secretary Clinton, last week you said we've got to do everything possible to. The first time I heard Hillary Clinton use the phrase implicit bias in the first debate, it didn't go unnoticed. <laughs> Mr. I think implicit bias is a problem for everyone, not just police. I think, unfortunately, too many of us in our great country um, jump to conclusions about each other. And therefore, I think we need all of us to be asking hard questions about, you know, why am I feeling this way? She answered it, that this is not just about the police. This is about all of us. That we ought to be asking ourselves, why do I have this feeling? Welcome to the first and only vice presidential debate of 2016. When I heard Mike Pence speak about implicit bias, it was obvious that he didn't know what it was. Governor when Pence, an African-American police officer is involved in a police action shooting involving an African-American, why would Hillary Clinton accuse that African-American police well, officer? It, of I, I guess I like can't that's when I thought, oh, Mike Pence doesn't get it. He thinks that if a black police officer shoots at a black person, that can't be implicit bias. That's how much work we have to do, that we haven't even gotten this simple idea through that women don't hire women and black police officers shoot black people because the bias is implicit. In order to think about where implicit bias comes from, it's a good idea to think about it as a combination of two things. First, our brains, human brains, have a certain way in which we go about picking up information, learning it. If I repeatedly see that doctors are male and nurses are female, I'm going to learn that. But the second part to implicit bias is the culture in which we live. There is a culture that for whatever reasons, has led to men being surgeons and women being nurses. If I lived in a culture where the opposite happened, I would have the opposite bias. Um, at any moment when we discover things about ourselves or about uh, the world that are new, we have to expect the kind of reaction that we're getting. But the mark of an evolved society is how quickly do we come to terms with it? How quickly do we realize that finding out that we're biased need not mean that we have to remain biased. So I have great hope just because I look at the history of this country, where we used to be and where we are today, and I see nothing but a path that is on the way towards doing better. Psychologist Mazarin Banaji, who helped come up with the theory of implicit bias. Let's take a moment to uh, jot down um, your thoughts and listening to Dr. Um, Banaji. See you. And I want to add that I'm asked to do uh, a lot of work around implicit bias. I'm actually designing a module for the Department of 
of Ed, and I'm I'm often torn because it is a powerful, powerful theory that we can see how it plays out, particularly in our younger years. The bias is implicit, it's inculcated into us. But I also find that people find it easier to talk about something that they say is implicit versus explicit. While the bias may be implicit, certainly the actions, when we act on that bias, is explicit and damaging and is related to the violence right, of what racism and stereotyping and, and living in a, in a society uh, where white supremacy is king, right? And that violence has been normalized in many ways within schools, within society. So what I, I want us to really think about is what are some of the implicit biases that you hold? But most importantly, how can you begin to eradicate them? because the individual matters. And the one thing that Dr. Banaji mentioned towards the end, that finding out that we are biased does not mean that we need to remain biased. And that is as leaders in particular, where folks are following you, you have to work on your own biases, right? Before you can invite others to change theirs. So understanding the role of the self and racism and bias Simone Gordon, a middle school teacher, I always like to bring teachers uh, into a space, particularly when I'm with leaders. Um, she says that when I think of the archeology span of the self in education, I compare it to an archeologist who uses various techniques to dig, uncover, identify, process, and record archeological remains as part of the excavation process. The same is with teachers, I wanna say leaders you know, like myself in education, who use tools and resources such as books, professional development, dialogue, and reflection to dig into our preconceived notions about the students and the communities we serve, as well as ourself, the teacher. I could not have written it better. Thank you, Simone Gordon. So here's a, a quick excavation activity I want you to answer. Take about a minute. I want you to think of a message about race that was reinforced throughout your entire life. Take a moment, jot something down as we start moving towards our breakout room, which will likely be 10 minutes. I'm cognizant of time. Think of a message about race that was reinforced throughout your life. You may want to focus on a particular group that you've been taught something about or just a general statement. And sometimes the word race is not even used. So just take a moment and think about that. My friend Vera Naputi said, she's been teaching for 27 years, and she said that archaeology of self is a responsibility we have as educators, and I want to say leaders, we're all educators, educational leaders, to love on ourselves, even when the uncovering and the discovery is hard. Love is hard work, but love is what got us here. So that was my second working agreement in terms of having grace with yourself, right? Because if you're truly doing this excavation process, and it takes you all the way back, uh, to early years in your life, people who are fond to you or fond of you and loved you deeply, but also taught you racist thinking that has impacted the way you see the world now, you will need to have some love and some grace. I'm going to skip this because I am cognizant of time, but I, I always try to bring students with me and this is the voice of one of my students. Well, let me play it. It's 30 seconds. Let me play it. This is Jillian, and she's allowed me to use her voice and her name. And I want you to think about what does Jillian offer you to think about your own practice? Her current flow within our weekly time together has been to sit, to tap into stillness, presence, clarity, conscience, and then to do the deep work, the crucial work, the building of authentic racial literacy. Speaking to the stillness. Mindfulness, as we've experienced weekly, can be an activator in the archaeology of the self. 
in becoming aware of and over time detoxifying oneself of preconceived notions and biases that were embedded long ago, and even in healing. Through our weekly sit, further enhanced by Mr. Napolitano's session, it is evident that mindfulness practice is an essential opportunity for all students and individuals. One commitment I now make in my teaching practice is to really aim to bring mindfulness work in on a daily basis, even if for a few minutes, to help my students clear themselves of their inner gook, to guide them through successful archeological digging and growth. So what is your inner gook? What is that deep, deep seated belief that you need to excavate? I'm glad I played Jillian's voice because she does address mindset. She addresses healing. And she talks about how mindfulness, taking a moment to breathe with my students, which is what I do, and her taking a moment to breathe with her students makes space for us to um, be open to new ways of thinking and being. And I'll share this with Joel. This is some work that I used to do at the NYU um, Center for Research on Equity and Transformation of Schools. There are a lot of frameworks that are out there. But we found that using this framework with school districts to help them um, release young people from special education that they were being disproportionately placed in, that we had to do our own work at the center with each other around awareness, understanding, practice, and sustained behaviors before we went out into the field. And so I share that with you, that a lot of times we want to lead and we want to push diversity and equity efforts without doing the self work um, and being and, and, and understanding our level of awareness, the depth of our understanding, our practices, do they match what we say? And then how do we sustain these behaviors that are equity based? So I have two questions before we go into our breakout. And I'm sorry for, um, I really would love to be with you for, for hours. Um, and hear your voices. But I have two questions. And the first is, what does our, the collective our, that could be uh, whoever the our is in your sphere of influence, what does our responsibility implementing racial literacy look like in an independent school network? That's the first question. What does our responsibility implementing racial literacy look like in an independent school network. And the second question is, what is my responsibility as a leader to build my racial literacy and learn the racism I've been taught and unearth practices that stand against equity in my school? And what will this look like for your staff? I'm not expecting you to have the full answer and many of you have been working on this, but I would love for you to, we don't have 15 minutes, but can we at least have, I don't know, can we have pairs, Joel, somehow just two people? And can we push to eight minutes? I'll sacrifice the few slides I have left so that people can be with each other. Yeah, that can work, Yolanda. Um, Mike, can we be in, um... Partnership, please. And I'll show the questions again. You can take up one of them, or at this time, maybe none of them. You can just talk about what you're thinking. You might want to screenshot them as you go into the breakout room. Brother Kwame, ah. Hey, my sis. Heart was, my heart was full before, it is now overflowing. <laughs> Hello, it's wonderful to see all of you. Hello, hello. Uh, with one minute left, um, I just wanted to, I do want to show this just as protocol just for any of you who may ever be interested. You know, we always try to learn something new. Um, you know, I want you to think about what's covering you uh, from really coming out, excavating uh, for equitable practices. And what I, I'll send these slides to Joel. Um, but what I really wanted to do 
is to say, stand out and be noticed for your humanity and love is the answer for any revolution that's gonna happen. And to encourage you to be the light because Amanda Gordon says that there's always light if only we're brave enough to see it and brave enough to be it. So I encourage you to be the light but I also want you to think about these probes. As you think about your time, we, the time we spent together, what struck you? What are you now wondering? What connections are you making to the work that you do and something that was shared today? And how would you like to continue the conversation? That's all I wanted to share. The slides will be coming your way. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you and Joel and Liz, I turn it over to you and I, I send you all off with peace and love. Have an incredible week. Excellent. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, you can see all the hearts all over <laughs> this, um, this um, screen. So um, you did an incredible job at opening our hearts and helping us be the light. So we very much appreciate your being our light um, today. And I also want to thank all of you who are here today, because what makes a, this collaborative work is all the people who have made a commitment to do this work in your schools and to share what you've done, to share with each other. Um, so thank you to all of you. Have an incredible um, last few weeks of schools, which I know can be super busy and stressful, but then um, take the time to be good to yourself and get rest over the summer because there's lots more work to do when um, we get back next year. And again, special thanks to um, both Yolanda and also Joel and Maddie and Jennifer. Um, and again, everybody who's here and part of this collaborative. Mm -hmm. So with that, we're all going to go out and be the light. Be the and light. The light and the love. Love you, Joel. Bye. <laughs> Bye guys. Sign the camera Bye. one way. Bye, Kwame. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I'm waving even though you Bye. can't see it. <laughs> we feel it. We feel it. Good, good, good. My camera's flashing. I don't know what happened. <laughs> oh, let it go. Right. Release it. Remember, what are you releasing today? The camera. <laughs> Thank you, Yolanda. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. Wow. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Maddie.